members of Madras Redford Doctors Foundation, friends of Madras Musings, welcome to the 15th online meeting of our foundation. Our nonprofit organization was founded by a few old graduates of Madras Medical College to support the college, its graduates and students, and to undertake some health-related charitable activities for the community in Chennai. Every month, members of our foundation come together to hear a speaker on an interesting topic, usually connected with medicine. The foundation is funded by membership fees and through public donations. Our website called tnmgc.com should give you a little more information about what we do. Now coming to this meeting, we are delighted to host this online event as part of the Madras Week. And it is apt that Sri Ram, who takes a very active part in the celebrations, Will today, address, will today address us on a topic that should be of interest to anyone connected with our city. Mr. Sriram does not need an introduction as he is well known to many both here and abroad. He's a businessman, historian, editor of Madras Musings and one of the secretaries of the Music Academy to name a few of the many hats he wears. He is a very popular speaker on a variety of topics, all meticulously researched. He's also a regular columnist in the Hindu. As an author, he has published many books on topics ranging from biographies to the history of many institutions and the heritage of Chennai. He pioneered the concept of heritage box in Chennai and tours in India that are highly popular. Many of us are readers of his blog, wherein we find a plethora of interesting information, like film songs of Esther Year, temples, and interesting comments about local issues. His talks, commentaries during the walks and tours, and these blogs are spiced with his inimitable humor that enlivens the details he shares with us about the culture, history, and local issues. We are delighted to have him with us today and look forward to hearing about the history of medicine in Madras. Sriram, I hope you are able to uh, tell us a little bit more about Madras Medical College as we are graduates of Madras Medical College. I now welcome Sriram to address our group. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Badrinath. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the invitation and also thank you for the lovely introduction that you gave me. Uh, as you know, I cannot refuse anything to you or to members of your family. Uh, your father-in-law, Mr. T.K. Singaram, was such a mentor and well-wisher that I can uh, never forget him. And uh, all of you are very dear to me. And when you said that I need to speak, I said, Definitely, it's a pleasure to talk on this subject. What I did not bargain for, which is rather stupid of me, is that there would be so many doctors listening in, which uh, has now made me exceedingly nervous. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, anyway, I hope to do some justice to the topic. The, uh, I have always wondered as to why this city is such a medical hub. And... Uh, I, I cannot say that I really have an answer for it. In 2016, when the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, held a symposium, they recognized medical tourism to be one of the great industries that Chennai has spawned. And they said that around 40% of India's medical tourism income comes from the state of Tamil Nadu and that the city of Chennai contributes significantly to that number. And they also said that Chennai by itself is ideally suited for being a medical capital because of this long history of the state's public health service and the fact that there have been historically very famous hospitals and doctors over here. And that the fact that there is a whole host of 
private hospitals in the city today that carry forward this legacy. And uh, I remember Mr. Mutaya and I, we went through the, that document and then we chatted about it. And I wrote a preliminary uh, article which appeared in Madras Musings at that time, talking about what potential Chennai has and about how at that time, the Kingdom of Dubai, the Emirate of Dubai, had also identified itself to be a potential medical capital. And uh, there was a huge move to take doctors and nurses from here and relocate them there. Madras became one of the favored destinations for sourcing medical professionals and taking them to Dubai at that point of time. I don't know if that trend still continues, what happened later, etc. But that is what really got me thinking. And then when I, I wrote a book on Chennai, which is supposed to get released this year in November, one of the chapters that I dedicated, uh, that I wrote in that book was on this medical, this trend of being a medical capital. Uh, at the end of it, I cannot say that I am very clear, but all I can say is that there are some very broad trends that emerge as to why this city continues to hold such a premier position in the world of, uh, in the medical industry. One of them, of course, is the historic fact that it was one of the three presidency cities of India and the government of that time, the colonial government of that time, invested a disproportionate amount of money on the three presidency towns, money that could have been spread onto the hinterland, but it was focused on the capital cities. And this is where education became very, very important. That is one. The other is that I believe that the spread of missionary education, today, this is a very sensitive topic and you know it raises hackles of many people, but it cannot be denied that missionary education was perhaps the first kind of education that was made open to everybody. And that opened the eyes of several people to the potential in the medical profession. And they then took to that. Historically, we've had a number of great institutions that came up in this city. What is very, what is most fascinating, however, is that at every crucial moment in the city's history, some stellar medical practitioners came up and they then continuously invested in placing the city on the medical map of India. Uh, this is in many ways, the medical profession is a very personality driven profession. It's like the legal profession. Uh, you can't be a faceless individual and uh, try to get along in this industry because you need to have a personality. And then the other important point of you have to be a Kairasi doctor, just like you have to be a Kairasi lawyer. Uh, I have heard so many people going to doctors and I often used to wonder, I would, I would imagine that it was an insult to the doctor's intelligence that our Kannala Patale Ella Sariya Poedam. So that means he's a miracle monger. He doesn't have any medical knowledge. It's something to do with his face or his eyesight, his or hers, uh, that, you know, they are able to just take one look at the patient, patient becomes okay. But this eventually is what fuels a great rush to one doctor or the other doctor. And some unfortunates are branded as Ayo Angalam Pona Unnami Narakade Padithin Deza Thirimbi Varano, Stretcher La Thukit Varvanga, Nalipair Thukit Varvanga, all these stories we have heard. And then it becomes a great challenge to fight that reputation and improve upon it and then get out of it. Perhaps several don't really do it. Uh, with that preamble, let me take you through what is my construct of the medical history of this city. Uh, I'm sure as it goes along, you will point, you will be, you people, because you are in the profession, will be able to identify several gaps, several errors in this presentation. Bear with me for that. And if I, if there is a lot of scope for correction, I'd be very happy to take them all down and improve upon it. Unfortunately, that book cannot be changed because it's gone into print. But as and when there is a second edition or if there is a second edition, then I will definitely be able to make the changes, incorporating the feedback that several of you will give me at the end of this presentation. I have put together a PowerPoint, which I will now open. And I'll take you through it. Just a minute. So uh, it's a wonder to me as to why there is no comprehensive medical history of Madras. 
it's a book that is crying to be written at some time. Uh, the legal profession, on the other hand, has been very fortunate because there is a century completed written by V.C. Gopalaratnam in 1962. And then recently, N.L. Raja, a senior advocate of Madras, has updated that book and brought out a new, a completely new work. I realized that in the medical profession, it's not possible because there all the lawyers work in the High Court of Madras. Whereas here, there is no one umbrella body under which all the doctors come. There are people, there are specializations, there are individual institutions, private bodies, and so on and so forth. It's almost impossible to create such a work. But if it was ever to be done, and if it was to even be a virtual, um, on a virtual platform, it would be one of the greatest databases of human effort, human endeavor, probably in the history of mankind. Today, we talk about, you know, frontline warriors. We talk about people who are sacrificing their lives in trying to keep this COVID pandemic at bay. But we have had a very long history of frontline warriors in this city, people of whom we need to be very, very proud. Let's proceed with the presentation. My first slide is the, I, I know it's very inappropriate in a life-giving profession that I begin with a tombstone. But this is the tombstone of Dr. Edward Bulkley which lies opposite the Madras Medical College, the old Madras Medical College. And this is in the ordnance lines inside the army land that is just opposite. I'm sure several of you are familiar. Opposite the Madras Medical College are the bookshops today, the secondhand bookshops. Behind that is army property. And if you go into that gate, the ordnance lines, you will come to this massive tombstone in granite. This is perhaps the great first memorial to a doctor in the city, Dr. Edward Bulkley, who practiced in Madras in the final years of the 17th century. Uh, he was a doctor here in, during the time when Elihu Yale was the governor of Madras. And Dr. Bulkley was the physician in charge of the Fort St. George Hospital, which today we recognize as the General Hospital. As we all know, the General Hospital began in 1664 inside Fort St. George. And then after having migrated to several places, arrived at its present location in the 1770s. At that time, a wall was constructed all around what was old Madras city. And there was a gate that led to the general hospital and that was known as the general hospital gate. This is the historicity of that institution that is standing there in terms of world history. It must be a record that there is a hospital that has continued to function from the same place since 1775. For no particular purpose, I think the name was changed to Rajiv Gandhi uh, General Hospital. All of us refer to it as GH, just as most of us don't think of Central Station as Dr. Purachi Talaiwar, MG Ramachandran uh, Railway Station. Uh, these are all unnecessary add-ons of history. These people have sufficient memorials to them at various places, and they were great leaders, there is no doubt. But Institutions like these do not need to get these added on. The reason why we remember Dr. Bulkley is that he conducts the first recorded post-mortem in the history of India. This is in the 1680s. One of the other doctors in Madras, his compounder mixes a medical portion in a bowl that previously contained arsenic and the patient dies. And the doctor comes to Dr. Bulkley and says, uh, in the language of that era, it is recorded, I have committed a murther, M-U-R-T-H-E-R. And thereafter, the first autopsy is conducted in modern times, and the cause of the death is established as arsenic poisoning. The doctor, of course, is pardoned, but the compounder is dismissed from service. We remember Bulkley for this, and we remember Bulkley for yet another thing. At that time, Yale was the governor, enormously corrupt, and therefore, there was a commission of inquiry that arrived from England. And during the process that Yale was still bribing them, they were taking action against him and his accomplices. And one of his accomplices was John Nix. John Nix was the husband of Yale's mistress, Catherine Nix, who was an independent businesswoman in her own right. John Nix was a, a warrant of arrest was served on John Nix. Immediately, Dr. Bulkley gave him a medical certificate saying that he is not fit for imprisonment. He was brought to the general hospital and he was kept there. 
Even today, this glorious tradition continues. Every time a politician is going to be arrested, he falls ill. And then they are immediately taken to hospital where a set of guards stand around them. The father of all this was Edward Bulkley, whom you see over here. The army has repeatedly tried to displace Dr. Bulkley from here because they need the land. But every time there has been a protest, the Archaeological Survey of India, of course, is very happy. They said it doesn't matter, one less monument for us to be pretending to be taking care of. But uh, the doctors of Madras are in love with Edward Bulkley. And up to now, Dr. Bulkley lies undisturbed opposite the Madras Medical College. Hopefully, he will be there for a long time to come. Uh, in the, we take a big jump. We don't really, we do know that the East India Company had a surgeon. There was a bur burgeoning, uh, you know, medical corps that was over here. There were army doctors, essentially. At that time, there were no medical practitioners who were, everybody was attached to the East India Company's army. There were no civil doctors, so to speak. And there were also native dressers. They were the medical attendants, the Indians who were attached to the various units in the army, the East India Company's army. They went everywhere that the army went. And of course, as we all know, it was always believed that wherever the army went, two things immediately followed. One was syphilis and the other was smallpox. And uh, one pox and the other pox. They followed wherever the army went. And which is why in Tamil, you have a term for the army camp, which is dand. And you often find in cantonment towns, and in that I include Mailapur also, you find a Dand Mariam and Kovil. Wherever the army was stationed, there would be an outbreak of smallpox and uh, they would worship this goddess. And that is how the smallpox was being treated at that time. In 1802, with Edward Jenner having fine-tuned his vaccination of smallpox in 1796 in England, the cowpox vaccine begins to come to India, being brought in what can what is just mind-boggling every time I think about it. I'm just amazed. The cowpox vaccine was sealed between two plates of glass. It would remain potent only up to the point that it reached Baghdad. Thereafter, it would, it would lose its efficacy. Immediately, somebody there would be vaccinated with the cowpox vaccine. He would be made to board a ship. The arm-to-arm -arm method of vaccination would then be followed. More and more people on the ship would be continuously vaccinated with cowpox. As and when the pustules break out, the vaccine would be uh, extracted. Finally, there would be a set of volunteers infected with cowpox by the time the ships docked in Bombay. And then they would be sent to various locations to continue with the vaccination process. This is how the vaccine was traveling. But Indians were very wary of this process. They were very familiar with variolation, but vaccination was something that was very new to them. And also it didn't help that the British government of that time was advertising this as Go Marial Seidapata vaccine. So when they saw the word Go Mari, they thought that they were killing cows and then extracting something from the cow because cow pox did not have a Tamil word. So Mahamari was smallpox. So they translated cow pox as Go Mari. And that immediately frightened off a whole lot of Indians who said we will have nothing to do with this particular vaccination. And uh, the Muslim community, if this was the problem with the Hindus, the Muslims also had their own objections. And finally, the government had to employ native vaccinators to take up this task. And exactly what is happening today was practiced in 1803. Incentives for the number of cases vaccinated. Today, the corporation workers get an incentive for the number of people they vaccinate. Gifts for the people who came forward for vaccination. And one of the men who made a killing on that entire activity was W.S. Swaminayak, whose monument you see over here. This is in Adityana Road, what was Harris Road in Pudupet, opposite the Komaleshwaran Pet Temple. Between 1803 and 1828, Swaminayak was the man who went around very often risking his life and uh, explaining to people as to what was happening and why they needed to get vaccinated. Eventually, he retires in 1828 with a life, with a whole lot of honors, including the privilege of being able to travel in a silver palanquin, which the government gives him, et cetera, et cetera. He lives in this area. And in 1963, his descendant, Justice W.S. Krishnaswami Naidu, erected this plaque in memory of his ancestor. 
it still stands over there as a memorial to one of the early medical practitioners of Madras city. We come to the general hospital. Today, of course, all of us are fed with news about how the GH is, you know, always suffering for infrastructure. It is known, uh, you know, there's a by, it's known as a byword of how things could go wrong in the medical profession and all that. What is forgotten is that this is the first rung of affordable medical treatment for the great poor of India, of Madras, of Tamil Nadu, particularly. They have nowhere else to go. They cannot be affording private medical treatment. This is where people have been coming for years. Uh, till 1842, this was not open to Indians. It was a whites-only hospital. And only from 1842 onwards, Indians were allowed in for medical treatment. Of course, just next to this is the famous Madras Medical College, begun as the Madras Medical School in 1835, becomes an adjunct of this particular, the two institutions have practically coexisted ever since that time. And that probably contributes to the glory of each of the institutions. I cannot imagine one surviving without the other. A lot of medical history has, of course, taken place in the general hospital. It often gets a bad press, but in my opinion, it's one of the most commemoration-worthy institutions possible because with the greatest of limitations in terms of infrastructure and facility, it continues to hand out a hand of hope to people who come here for medical treatment. In Madras Bashe, this gives rise to a very unique word, Savagraki. Let's not forget that because you have the central station on the opposite side and you have the general hospital on this side. All the jatkas would line up in the morning for savari for awaiting passengers coming off trains. If they didn't get a savari on that side, they'd come to the general hospital where the mortuary would begin offloading the patients, the dead bodies. So the body would then be taken to the respective homes in the jatka. And that was known as savagraki. Kalangarthala modal padithinde vanda adhaka savagraki in peru. So that term has become immortalized in our in Chennai's lingo, thanks to the juxtaposition of the central station and the general hospital. If these two had not coexisted, we would have had a, we wouldn't have had this wonderful word. We now come to the Kilpok Institute of Mental Health. This completed 225 years, just a few years ago. It's known, unfortunately, at that time as the Mad Hospital, then as Dr. J. Dalton's Mad Hospital, and thereafter, has continued and is today named as the Institute of Mental Health. I'll be coming to mental history a little later, mental health history a little later in this, uh, in this presentation. But imagine an institution specializing in mental health for more than 225 years in a city. What more do we want to establish a kind of a medical record in a metropolis? If that is the, key, the story of the Institute of Mental Health, we now come to what was known as the native infirmary. I told you that the general hospital opened itself only in 1842 to the Indians. Where were they going before that? They must have gone to a whole lot of native Indian practitioners. But for the first time, we hear of a hospital run on Western lines being opened for Indians. And that is the what we recognize today as the Stanley Medical Hospital begun in 1799 as the medical, as the native infirmary and located on Moniger Chowdhury Road, MC Road, which is how it is referred to today. Hardly anybody thinks of opening up initials and finding out what is the history behind it. Just next to the Stanley Medical Hospital, you have this building, the Moniger Chowdhury, established in 1782, home for destitutes, disabled persons. What is Maniga Chowdhury? Mania Karan Chowdhury. That is, Mania Karan was the local headman and in his name, a Chowdhury. During the time that there was famine, this is where gruel would be handed out to all the starving people. And we have had a lot of history of famine in Madras presidency. Let's not forget that the Buckingham Canal, when it was dug in 1875, was dug only as a famine relief measure. And this was the place where people would come to collect their daily portion of gruel, which is why this area becomes Kanji Toti 
and the hospital becomes Kanjitoti Hospital. Even today, there are people over there who will not refer to it as Stanley Medical Hospital. They'll refer to it only as Kanjitoti Hospital. This is a name that goes back to the 1790s, practically. And even today, between Monigar Chowdhury, which is this home for destitutes, and Stanley, there is an understanding when people here die, their bodies are handed over for medical research to the Stanley Medical Hospital. That is just next door, Stanley Medical Hospital and college. We've had an eye hospital here from 1818. The second oldest eye hospital in the whole world after the Moorfield Eye Hospital in England. And inside it, which most people don't know, except for people in the medical profession, there is a wonderful museum for the eye. It has drawings done by doctors over several years, original drawings, things that they have observed. Of course, I wouldn't go near it after having had breakfast or before lunch or before dinner or anything of that kind, because those drawings are really frightening for a lay person. For a medical person, I'm sure they'll be very interesting. But this is an institution that has continued in existence from 1818. So we've had a Kanjitote hospital. We have a Kanna Asputri also over here. We come to certain pioneering doctors who created medical history around this kind of infrastructure that existed. So you had the, you had the native infirmary or the Stanley Medical. It became Stanley Medical in the 1930s. You had the Madras Medical College and you had the General Hospital. You had uh, certain other institutions that were coming around this place. You had the Institute of Mental Health, the Eye Hospital. And then you have the path-breaking identification of Kala Azar by Colonel Charles Donovan, who lived in Madras, practiced in the Madras General Hospital. And this is where he identified the organism that caused the Kala Azar or the yellow fever. And at the same time, this had been identified by a certain Leishman somewhere else, which is why the organism is even today known as Leishman Donovani. And for a long time, there was a plaque in the General Hospital that commemorated this identification. Mr. Mutaya even had a photograph of it. I'm told that the plaque doesn't exist any longer. I'm not sure about that. But if so, it's a bit of a pity. Around this time, you find a whole lot of community hospitals starting to come up. This is a trend that continues from the 1850s and goes on almost to 1950 or so. 200 years of Gujaratis creating small hospitals, Marbadis, Jains, missions, and finally, from the 1940s onwards, a whole lot of industrial houses setting up hospitals in the city. So if you go to the Georgetown area, you will find a whole lot of endowed hospitals created by communities. And then if you go to places like Ambatur, Nanganallur and all that, you'll find a whole lot of corporate institutions like the Ivan Steadiford Hospital created by the Murgapa Group or the uh, Margaret Sydney Hospital created by the Rane Group. These are all institutions that came up because the factories were located at places where there were no hospitals, no nursing homes. Lots of workers were coming in to settle down over there. They needed medical facility. And therefore, these institutions started coming up. So this creates a certain parallel network as against the big institutional networks. In 1911 comes up the Roy Peta Hospital. And Roy Peta Hospital today, of course, it's a beautiful red building and we know it as one of the major centers of excellence as far as medical treatment is concerned. Let's not forget that Ronald Ross, Sir Ronald Ross, who identified the malaria causing a parasite or the role of the Anopheles mosquito in malaria. He began his research work in the Roy Peta Hospital. And finally, when he published his research work, he gave a huge chunk of thanks to a nurse, Amy Skelland, who was an Anglo-Indian nurse attached to the Roy Peta Hospital, who worked with him and gave and did many of the drawings. A woman who is completely forgotten today, but remembered in Sir Ronald Ross's uh, documentation. So this was, again, a very interesting feature. We now come to the history of obstetrics and gynecology. I have no idea how women delivered prior to the arrival of the Raja Sir Savale Ramaswamy Mudaliyar lying in hospital in Rayapuram, the RSRM lying in hospital in Rayapuram. This is Raja Sir Savale Ramsami Mudaliyar, one of the first Indians to prove that we were better in running businesses as compared to what the British were. He was the Dubash of a company called DD Dimes and Company. 
and that company went bust in the 1870s. Ramsamy Mudaliar took over the company, made a success of it, and then owned huge properties in the Kilpok area, Flowers Road, that, uh, you know, that intersection. He endowed that hospital, which became the RSRM. He was given the title of Raja. He was knighted. And in the time of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee as Queen, in 1887, he created the RSRM lying in hospital. And from that time onwards, we get to know about women going in for medical treatment to hospitals, delivering in, in, a, in a facility like that. But we wouldn't have had anything without this woman, Mary Ann Darkholm Sharlib. William Sharlib was a lawyer in Madras. Mary Ann was his young wife whom he had married in England and brought back to Madras. And Mary Ann helped her husband with reading medical docu legal documents. And one document was about a woman who had died in childbirth because there was no medical treatment available, depended on midwives. And that is when Mary Ann begins to make a study of how Indian women deliver, finds out that there are no gynecologists qualified except the white skins and realizes that there are no women either. So finally, tries to join the Madras Medical School, is rudely rebuffed, is told by the superintendent of the hospital that women like you are fit enough to be nurses. You will not be able to enter this place to qualify as a doctor. Finally, puts up a petition which a whole lot of people sign, enters the medical college, qualifies as a licentiate of medical practice and LMP, sets up practice in Madras, becomes a huge success, goes back to England to become an, M uh, an MBBS in Vienna, comes back to Madras, sets up medical practice once again over here. Queen Victoria gets to know about this lady, this remarkable lady, and asks her as to what she would like. And she says, I would like to set up a hospital in Madras city for women. And that is how the Royal Victoria Caste and Gosha Hospital in Triplicane comes about, today recognized as the Kasturba Gandhi Medical Hospital. And uh, in the late 1880s, Mary Ann is going back to England to settle there for good. One night, just a few days before she is leaving, a woman arrives. I mean, a family arrives. There is a Brahmin woman who is in the throes of labor, has been in labor for more than 24 hours. The baby is not showing any signs of coming out. So our friend rushes for medical treatment. For the first time in the history of Madras, uses a pair of forceps to extract the child and does it with such force that there are a couple of dents on the forehead of the baby for the rest of the baby's life. Now, that baby is a girl. She would grow up to become Sister R.S. Subalakshmi, the woman who reformed the world of widows, treatment of widows, set up a widow rehabilitation home in the ice house, made sure that women could come forward and take to a whole lot of professions, including the medical profession, and one of the women who followed the lead given by Sister R.S. Subhalakshmi was Dr. E.V. Kalyani, one of the pioneering medical practitioners of Madras. So had it not been for Mary Ann Dako, Charlie abusing a pair of forceps one night in Madras city, we wouldn't have had R.S. Subhalakshmi. Had it not been for R.S. Subhalakshmi, we would not have had E.V. Kalyani and so on and so forth. This story is one of those very slender, fascinating threads of Madras history. I mentioned Mary Ann Dakom Sharlib, and thereafter we have the famous maternity hospital, the uh, now known as the Institute for Women and Children, of which I think you all know, designed like a pelvis at one time. Much of it now modernized and demolished, but I think this part of it alone survives, and we must be thankful for small mercies. There is a feeling in the government that if you need to preserve a building, all you need to do is to preserve the front. The rest of it can be demolished. The facade is all that matters. It's very reflective of the times in which we live. And so that is probably the eventual fate of this building as well. I now move to the early 1900s when X-ray makes its appearance for the first time in Madras. We know that within five years of Ranjan creating the X-ray machine or discovering X-rays, we had an X-ray unit in Madras in the general hospital. It was here, long before it was available in many European hospitals in many other locations of the world. How it came here, we have no idea. There is a fantastic blog by Manmathan Ullathil. It's called maddiesramblings.blogspot.com. You should go and see it. We published that entire article in Madras Musings. 
it talks about how x-rays arrived in india and how x-rays came to madras so in 1905 in 1900 or so the general hospital had a unit but of course that was not functioning and there was a dr p anand rao in uh, p rama rao in punamalli high road who had a private x-ray facility at around that time and that was very very successful that is when we we have the first world war in 1914 to 1919 and somewhere in turkey in gallipoli there is an x-ray machine which has been sent there for identifying injuries of soldiers during the first world war there is a technician who has gone along with that particular x-ray unit his name is barnard he is not a doctor he is just a technician taking care of the machine end of the war he is told that the machine is going to be packed off to bombay so he goes along with it and comes to the baikula hospital where he sets up the x-ray unit there is a hilarious account of how he does it they don't take care of voltages and then they finally make a patient lie on it and they switch it on and there's a huge spark and by the time they put out all the sparks that patient has run away eventually they make a success out of that x-ray unit and somewhere in the 1920s barnard is told that you are now going to madras where you are going to become the head of the radiology department so he comes over here sets up an x-ray unit for the general hospital not a doctor mind you but eventually everybody refers to him as dr barnard and finally in 1934 when the institute of radiology is going to be set up they invite him for it without telling him that it's going to be named after him he arrives over there he has a very pleasant surprise and he then is immortalized today in the barnard institute of radiology which used to be in rayapeta and then shifts to the general hospital there is a fantastic tribute written to barnard by dr arcot gajraj who later is one of the very prominent radiologists of this city and that is available on the internet and i request you to read it because it gives a fascinating tribute to this man who was a pioneer who didn't have any idea of medical treatment but just came as a technician and finally became a doctor of some kind a pioneering uh, woman i don't think she needs any introduction dr muthulakshmi reddy without whom we would not be able to uh, uh, you know we, we without whom there would not have been an anti devadasi movement without whom there would be no cancer hospital today the woman who was so very brave in everything that she needed she did she requires a full presentation but in the interest of time i am going to move on but certainly dr muthulakshmi reddy was one of the landmarks of madras medical history without her we would not have had many achievements and as you know the cancer institute later dr shanta and several others and today it remains a center for excellence in this city we come to some of the early indians who were doctors the first man who we can identify is senji parani andi who spelled his name as pulni andi p u l n e y a n d y this man qualified from the madras medical college as an lmp and then goes to scotland and comes back as a md or a, i mean he acquires a post graduate degree from there sets up practice in madras practices in the egmore area acquires a lot of land in that locality today the egmore railway station stands on the property that senji parani andi owned so he is one of the early medical practitioners indian medical practitioners of the city then from the 1920s we have a whole lot of stars of whom we have a decent bit of contemporary history dr u ramarao who was a specialist in treatment of malaria becomes a congress freedom fighter sets up a civil disobedience hospital somewhere in the punamalli high road area i have no idea where and treats people who come in after being beaten by lathi charges during civil disobedience protests founds the madras music academy and was its first president was the president of the madras legislative council resigns in 1930 a big star in his own right dr ev srinivasan pioneer pioneering ophthalmologist who it was said could be devastatingly rude to his patients but was at the same time a great eye doctor the father of dr ev kalyani it is said that if patients came to him and said rendanaala kannu romba urutar the doctor he would say paravalla kaiti potudlam apdi paduthukenga eduthidren kanna so that was the kind of uh, brain which he would deal with patients 
And then we have, of course, Dr. Krishnan Gopinath Pandale, with whom the great Poonamali High Road tradition really begins. In 1932, we have the inauguration of the Pandale Nursing Home. And thereafter, a whole host of doctors, uh, all of them set up practice on that Sundaravadanam, uh, Yesudhyan, several others uh, set up practice, the you Mohan Rao, you Rama Rao, that entire family, that entire clan, several people set up practice on Poonamali High Road. I have always wondered as to what was the glamour of Poonamali High Road. And then I come to realize that on one side, you have the general hospital. The right in the middle, you have the Kielpok Medical Hospital. And that must have been such an important thoroughfare at that time with two great medical institutions that a whole lot of doctors must have decided to set up practice there. At one time, if you were a surgeon particularly, you had to be in Punamali High Road. That was the locality that you had to be in. And apart from them, you had two other great doctors. I'm very sorry for the poor quality of the photographs. Uh, but one of them, the one on the left, Dr. Rangachari, and on the right, Dr. M.R. Guruswami Mudaliyar, whose grandson is Dr. Badrinath, who is today the host of this evening's, this evening's program. Both of them with statues on either side of the general hospital. Both of them practicing on Poonamali High Road. Dr. Rangachari lived in a house called Kingston, where the Sita Kingston School came up later. And much later, today it is called the Kanchipuram Ekamranatha Swami Temple Trust School or some such thing. But the house is still there. Dr. Gursami Mudaliyar lived on Gursami Mudaliyar Road, which is a cutting off Punamali High Road. Both of them pioneering doctors in their own right. Dr. Rangachari, of course, a lot has been written about him. A little less has been documented about Dr. Gursami Mudaliyar. But I, I witnessed something that I have never forgotten. Uh, one morning, my father-in-law had severe distress and uh, he was a heart patient and we thought that, uh, you know, he was having a heart attack. And we rushed him to Dr. Vardarajan, who is a family friend and is one of the senior most vascular surgeons of the city, now well into his 90s. This happened around 15 years ago or maybe even earlier. And I remember Dr. Vardarajan made my father-in-law sit and then put his hand like this and tapped him all over, front and back. And I had never witnessed anything like this. And at the end of it, he just said, it's a digestive disorder. There is nothing wrong with your heart. Just go home and relax and take a couple of tablets and you'll be all right in a few days. It's a severe digestive disorder. It may take a little while for you to become okay. Then I called Dr. Vardarajan later and said, what exactly did you do? He said, you have never heard of Dr. M.R. Gursami Mudalya? I said, yeah, I've seen his statue outside the general hospital. He said, well, that's all you know. He was a master of the percussion way of diagnosis, something that is completely forgotten. And you brought your father-in-law at 6.30 in the morning to me. There was no other way that I could have identified what was wrong with him. I wanted to reassure you people. And I just followed what I had seen Dr. Gursami Mudaliyar do. And this is all that had to be done. I was completely taken aback. I had never heard of such a thing. And then he told me, don't go around expecting doctors of today to tell you about these things. So that was also Dr. Vardarajan's parting shot, because I'm sure today diagnostics have improved and we are dependent so much on gadgets of various kinds. Dr. Lakshman Sami Mudaliyar, who can forget this famed gynecologist of Madras, vice chancellor for almost, if I'm not mistaken, 22 or 23 years of the Madras University, whose statue stands outside the University of Madras, and a man who probably defined education for a long period to come. Many, many institutions of Madras University would come up during his time and a great man. Two doctors who became mayors of Madras, Dr. P.V. Cherian, the ENT, and Dr. U. Krishna Rao, who was mayor of Madras in 1947-48. Here you see him, diminutive figure between the Mountbatten's outside Ripon building. And Cherian was, of course, a very famous ENT. The only example of a husband and wife both becoming mayors of Madras. Cherian was a mayor. His wife, Tara, was also a mayor. And my favorite story is about of Dr. Cherian is because he was an ENT specialist. He had a patient one day coming to see him with frequent recurrence of throat trouble. He then realizes that she has inflamed tonsils, very, very inflamed, probably requires surgical treatment. But the problem is that this patient is M.S. Subalakshmi. Who would put a knife to that throat? 
So he just tells her that you'll have to live with it. There is no surgeon in Madras who is going to be able to put a knife to you. Just gargle and treat yourself and ensure that you don't drink anything cold and you'll be completely all right. So that was Subhalakshmi. The history of tuberculosis is again a very long story. But today we have a place called the Thambaram Sanatorium. There is no sanatorium over there. Today it is the Ayodhidas Pandidar Siddha Medical Hospital. Why is it called the Tambaram Sanatorium? Because of Dr. Jacob, Jacob Aaron Chaurimuttu, who in the 1920s begins a sanatorium over there. A man who had practiced in England, treated Srinivasa Ramanujam, the mathematician over there, comes down to Madras, starts that sanatorium. This is a photograph of that sanatorium on the day that it was inaugurated. Later on, the sanatorium is taken over in the 1930s by the government. And that is where we have much of the Siddha Hospital today on this campus. But thereafter, there is a very long history of tubercular treatment in this city. Dr. Madhuram Santosham, who starts the Santosham Chest Hospital, freedom fighter, Swatantra Party follower of, of, of Rajaji. And in the 1950s, when the great Madras, medic, when the great Madras experiment happens in tuberculosis, see, the, United, the World Health Organization wants to experiment and find out whether we can have whether sanatoriums are absolutely necessary for the treatment of tuberculosis or whether a patient treated at home with modern medication would recover the same way as a patient in a sanatorium. This was known as the Great Madras Experiment. And Dr. Santosham ran a sanatorium and he knew exactly what the end result of that study is going to be, but he wholeheartedly supported that study. And at the end of it, it was proven that patients could be treated as well at as home as they could be in a sanatorium. Thereafter, sanatoriums all across the world went bust. But Dr. Santosham continued running his sanatorium for a long time. And he used to joke that it gave him a return of one and a half percent per annum. And that was the hospital that he ran. Today, it is the Dr. Boas Center for Psychiatric Treatment in Manimangalam. Ayurvedic treatment would have never started off had it not been for Vaidya Ratna Vardhara Ajulu, who then dies very early. But we have a medical, an allopathic doctor, an eye specialist, Dr. A. Ramarao, who takes over that hospital and makes it a modern medical institution, runs an Arogya Ashrama in Avadi. And that entire land is taken over in the 1940s by the government for setting up the defense establishments. He receives a lot of money, places it in trust and hands it over to his son-in-law, Dr. B. Ramamurthy, who then becomes the father of neurological sciences in Madras. Two institutions still commemorate Dr. Rama Rao, Achanta Ramarao, because one is in the VHS campus, the other is in the General Hospital campus, both begun by Dr. Ram Murthy, commemorating his father-in-law because that was the money that came from the sale of the Arogya Ashrama in Avadi. But I must also tell you that around this time in the 1920s, Indian medical practice, not Western medical practice, comes into its own with the setting up of a school for tropical medicine in Kielpok. This is started in 1925 in a building called Hyde Park Gardens. And this is the structure that later would become the Kielpok Medical College. That institution has a very checkered history. That is that School of Tropical Medicine. It is closed. Then it is reopened in Sirnal Bailey. Finally, it comes back to Annanagar, where it still exists. But this campus becomes the Kielpok Medical College thereafter. In the middle of the Kielpok Medical College, there is a statue to Dr. Srinivasa Murthy who was a big, very important functionary of that school of tropical medicine. It's very interesting that in an allopathic institution, we still have a statue for someone who pioneered Indian style of medication. And then we have the, after that, he founded IMCOPS in Adyar, which is still there as a center for Indian medicine. Smallpox, we started with our friend uh, Swami Nair. We need to finish the story of smallpox. In the 1960s, Madras was still a smallpox capital of the whole world. Every year, hundreds were dying. Every year, hundreds were being disfigured by the disease. Till we had this doctor, Dr. Ayagari Ramachandra Rao, in the 
Institute of Communicable Diseases, Thondayarpet, the Communicable Diseases Hospital, Thondayarpet. He is the man who, like the COVID of today, identifies that smallpox comes in waves. The first year is the most severe wave. Second year is the moderate wave. Third year is the light wave. When you have the light wave, you need to vaccinate everybody because the next year is going to be a very severe wave. He is the man who begins that. At that time, there is a belief that infants do not benefit from the smallpox vaccination. But in 1965, Dr. Ayagari Ramachandra Rao decides every baby born in a government medical facility would be inoculated against smallpox. The next year, smallpox practically vanishes from the city of Madras. The World Health Organization wakes up, comes down, makes him a consultant. He then travels all over the world lecturing on smallpox, writes a book on the eradication of smallpox. And had it not been for him, that great virus, probably the only virus that has been eradicated so far, it would still be running around and we would still be fighting it. I'm coming to very recent history. Who can forget Dr. Thambaya, the dermatologist, on Poonamali High Road, my memory is of queues and queues and queues standing outside his house or clinic, waiting to get in to be treated. Everybody was treated with the same kindness. You could be a multimillionaire, you could be an ordinary person. Everybody was treated the same way. Dr. Venkat Swami, who created the Center of Excellence in the Stanley Medical Hospital for Digit Reconstruction, realized that with all the industrial establishments in that area, workers were putting their hands into heavy presses getting fingers mutilated, starts off this center for digit reconstruction in the 1970s. In the first month of that institute, they conduct 1,000 surgeries for reconstruction of the hand. That was the kind of demand that existed for it. And still today, Stanley is recognized as a center of excellence for this one. The Perambur Railway Hospital, where the first open heart surgery was conducted in India, this becomes a recruiting ground for the great Apollo Hospital. Apollo, in many ways, is a controversial subject. People talk about how, you know, it starts off with a commercial motive. And that cannot be denied. But Dr. P.C. Reddy always made it clear that he wanted to create a center of excellence that would run on commercial lines. There are many ways of looking at medical treatment. This was one way, and we cannot deny it, that he moved heaven and earth, including the changing of legislation in India. Prior to that, hospitals could not be given loans by banks. He had to go all the way, lobby with the prime minister, lobby, lobby with the president, get the rules in India to be changed, a huge pioneer. And finally, we have the Apollo Hospital today. Apollo Hospital completely created a huge jump in medical standards. Thereafter, almost all institutions in the city had to follow. A diametrically opposite, and started by a doctor from the same HM hospital from which Dr. Reddy came, Dr. Badrinath, who began the Shankar Netralia with affordable medical treatment. I always am very amused when I go to both these locations because I'm practically taken back to Calcutta from where I come. You can hear only Bengali in huge waves coming around you in both Apollo and Shankar Netraloy. In fact, the signboards are written in Bengali or all around the place. The staff talk in Bengali. It's a little bit of Bengal over here. Many Bengalis view this as a holiday home. You know, they just love to come here to get treated in Apollo and Shankar Netralia. And they flood these two institutions. Mental health in Chennai is pioneered by four great institutions. All of them started off by women. Shanti Ranganathan, not a doctor, but begins the Titi Ranganathan Memorial Hospital for recognizing that alcoholism and addictions are all diseases that need to be treated. Sneha, Lakshmi Vijay Kumar and Vijay Kumar's pioneering institution, which counsels against suicides. Very important in this city. How many of us know that Chennai is a suicide capital of the world? Every year when examination results are announced, students go and kill themselves. We are surprisingly, Sneha has been doing a huge bit of work over there. Scarf started by Dr. Sharda Menon and Dr. Tara doing immense work in schizophrenia. And finally, Banyan, Vandana and Vaishnavi began this as a place where people with mental illnesses could be treated. I'm coming to the last slide of my presentation. We are Indians. We don't believe that we practice sex. And we also believe that babies are given to us by the grace of God. 
so naturally when aids began you know coming all around the world we believed that we were immune to it because of the good way in which we lived you know what homosexuality unheard of going to prostitutes never we are good people it was dr shanti solomon who said that we are not any different from any other place and we need to start testing to see if aids is prevalent in india and with samples in salem that is where the whole thing really begins this whole exercise begins proves that aids already exists over here and that is when the first aids treatment facilities start coming up in this city and thereafter it spreads all over india dr solomon is no more but i think we need to salute her for having identified a scourge when it was in its very early stages and helping to ensure that we were able to treat it lastly we would have been nowhere without nurses and pharmacies let's not forget that in 1901 we had our first institute for nurses started by lady amthill the photograph that you see on the left that becomes the lady willingdon nursing home in 1920s named after the lady you see on the right lady on the left very good lady lady on the right not so good lady who had a strong urge to steal anything that was not nailed down or screwed or fixed with fevicol but did a lot of good for the women of madras was a woman who identified that women needed to find their own place started the first women's club encouraged sister r s subalakshmi in a big way started the nurses institute began the lady willingdon nursing home and then we have one of the pioneering pharmacists of madras wilfred pereira and sons he was the one who created the pharmaceutical association of india and thereafter pharmacists have never looked back it's been one roller coaster journey i'm sorry if it didn't make sense to many of you or if there were too many names but this just gives you a small sampling of what medical practice has done in this city this is a phenomenon i doubt if any other city has had such a continuous record of excellence of so many people involved so many people contributing to it in a big way and i think it is a topic that deserves to be celebrated at all time thank you very much sri ram what a brilliant talk i mean fascinating we can uh, you you need not stop we can listen to you you know for hours together brilliant it is very very interesting uh, we had a few uh, uh, chats from people around as one of them says dr p v cherian uh, dr mohan sundaram says dr p v cherian also became the governor of maharashtra right. yes he did um and dr mohan sundaram says for the manyaka chowtri the chief surgeon of stanley hospital is the chief That's trustee right. yes that is right and i'm sorry i said dr shanti solomon i must have that's right that's that's, that's what was that was shanti also solomon correct. is the name absolutely yeah. i mean there is no doubt about it uh i think that's about it eh? it's brilliant uh, i don't know uh, sri ram i don't know how to thank you because this has been one of the best uh, talks we have had thank you very much and i'd like to invite uh, uh professor murli from san diego um who is the neurosurgeon there and he's going to propose a vote of thanks uh murli is the son of uh, professor rajagopalan who was a pioneer uh, uh, i think he started uh, the anesthetic department in government general hospital and he was the first anesthetist to bring the boils apparatus to madras or to india even Uh, yes. and he he was the one who installed the boils apparatus which is the most important uh, machine for anesthetizing patients and he brought that to government general hospital yeah he was at the university of oxford and worked there under a very famous anesthesiologist by the name of robert Ma sir robert mackintosh mm -hmm. and at the end of his uh, training there um he was given this machine by oxford and he brought it to madras and uh, started a type of anesthesia known as endotracheal anesthesia where a tube was inserted into the trachea for giving anesthesia prior to that anesthesia was given through a mask 
a mask was placed on the nose and ether was dripped onto this mask, much to the annoyance of the patient, needless to say. Uh, what can I say? I'm almost speechless. Uh, I am from Madras and uh, I uh, studied at Madras Medical College and General Hospital in the 60s. And therefore, I have some personal knowledge of many of the great people mentioned in this talk. Uh, people such as Dr. B. Ramamurthy, who was one of my teachers, Dr. A. L. Mudaliar, who was the vice chancellor of our university, and in fact, my MBBS certificate is signed by him, and uh, many others. Uh, Absolute, absolutely a spell binding talk and uh, the Madras Redford Doctors Foundation. We are so fortunate to have a person of your caliber, world renowned, give us this talk uh, for um, our foundation. I'm very touched by your generosity, Sri Sri Ram. Uh, it is late in the evening and for you to accept this invitation and give such a fantastic talk. And just looking at the PowerPoint slides, I think I know that this uh, presentation was specifically made for us. I don't think uh, this was a canned talk no. <laughs> that you had that you simply release today. These slides and the way this talk is constructed, I think this is a custom made talk. And uh, I know how long it must have taken you to put all this together. And uh, I'm touched e even more. Uh, we had almost a hundred participants today, which I think is the most we have ever had for our monthly talks. But of course, the quality of your presentation is unrivaled. I know you quite well because I subscribe to the Hindu, although I'm in San Diego. I read the Hindu every day and I read your columns. I also get your emails. I follow the Madras musings. And I'm very familiar with your interest in topics as widely ranging from Carnatic music to tennis to tuberculosis, to an interview about the famous Alwar Andal, which I have seen, which I greatly enjoyed. I mean, I think I can see your repertoire is extremely wide. So Sri Sri Ram, thank you for a brilliant talk. Uh, we will keep this in our website. And I can assure you that many of us We'll go back here and uh, look at this with great fondness. Uh, thank you again. It's late in the evening. I'm not going to belabor this word of thanks. I can talk about you and this talk for a long time. But honestly, uh, this was a riveting talk that mesmerized us. Just thank you, Sri Sri Ram, and God bless you for such outstanding contributions that you make. Thank you. Thank you.